All right, everybody, we'll get started here. Hopefully your seat is comfortable. Did anyone attend the single beam errors? OK. This will be very similar to that one with a little bit more emphasis on the multi-beam side. So some of the slides are going to be repeated. Uh, just be aware of that. OK. So multi-beam sources of error. If any of you have already surveyed with multi-beam, you know that it is very prone to some peculiarities, shall we say. So what we're going to be talking about in this session here is we're going to talk about the components of depth, what makes our raw depth components, how we position the data, issues arising with that, RTK tides, issues arising with that, heave dynamics, and a few other issues here. Uh, as always, uh, feel free to ask a question at any time. Want me to go back, whatever, feel free to ask. Question for you. What do you think is the number one source of error in any survey? If you were at the last session, do not answer this. You! You are the largest source of error. OK? What do I mean by that? That means that you maybe entered in settings wrong. You transposed numbers. I've done it. I'm 100% guilty of it. Went to go measure something, transposed a number. Threw it off by a foot. It happens. Missing warning signs. High pack alerts you. If something goes wrong, high pack, not always, but there are warning signs within the software designed to help you realize there might be a problem. If you didn't clue into that, or you were distracted or whatnot, which totally can happen, you miss it. Or between the office and the field, there was a miscommunication between there. Somebody told you to survey in the, uh, with a different piece of hardware than you meant, or wrong boat or whatever, whole host of reasons. But 90% of the time, it's user error. So be aware of that. So how can we reduce human error? One, humility. Don't be afraid to say you don't know something or you don't have a clue. It is very hard, and I understand this, for those of us who are in the field, we don't want to report back a mistake to the office. That's a problem way down the road. This goes for people in the office, too. Remember that your staff in the field are human. They're going to fuck it up. Yes, I used that word. But it's true, OK? So admit your mistakes. It's number one. Also, document. When you're in the field, write everything down. It's very common. Every time I go to trainings nowadays, it's really common that people are not taking field notes. There's no record of what lines you're doing, what your offsets are using, what base station you put up, what base station you're using. There's no documentation for your survey. So one, document your survey. Write down the lines you're doing, what happened on the lines, if you lost RTK, any of that information. And then maintain. One of the other biggest problems is people don't maintain their equipment. You go out, you leave it on the shelf, it sits up there for two years before you've used it. You run out onto the boat, hook it all up, and expect it to work the day you want to survey. Good luck. Okay? Maintain your equipment. That means going out to the um, warehouse, sending the equipment in for calibration, bench testing it, checking your cables for nicks or scrapes or whatever, checking that all your power works, etc. If you can't figure it out, that's why support exists. That is literally my job, so call. I have a, a procedure here that if I can't figure it out in 15 minutes, I'm picking up the phone. That doesn't mean I stop trying to solve the issue. That just means I'm calling in reinforcements. Sometimes you will call us, and we will be backed up, because you are not the only one calling for help. So if you call support, Keep troubleshooting the problem. A lot of the times when we call you back, you're like, oh, yeah, I figured it out. Cool. Awesome. So keep that up. So here's a perfect example. We had this pretty recently. User sent us this data, right? We've got big, giant stripe down the center of it. It's clearly not in line with the rest of the data, OK? When they collected this data, they were going out, collecting it, doing a sound velocity cast. Taking that cast in high sweep while surveying, 
and putting that into high sweep survey. When you do that, what happens is, is high sweep survey puts that sound velocity cast at the top of the HSX file, and then it uses it there on. What happened is, and it took us a little while to figure it out, this user put in the cast without double checking it. What happened is, down here at the bottom where it's highlighted, you'll see SVC. There's a big fat zero. We know that sound velocity in water is not zero. That caused that stripe in the data. And that was because it wasn't reviewed before applying it to the data. Again, user error. It dropped down to the bottom, got stuck in the mud, got a zero reading. Sent it to support. It took us a little bit to figure it out, but we figured it out, and it's a zero. So right here, take a look at your sound velocity profiles. We're going to talk about sound velocity in a little bit, but double check stuff. Don't assume that everything is working properly. OK. Yes? So it depends a little bit on what your survey units are. But here's a little bit of a weird thing the way HiPack works. So for example, AML has the ability, you can set the export to feet in an AML export. The problem is, is that the high pack sound velocity is expecting the sound velocity readings to be in meters per second, and then it will convert it. So what I tell people is keep your depths, because we won't convert the depth, but we convert the sound velocity. So keep the depths in feet, and then the velocity in meters per second, AML, for example, won't let you split that in the export. So what you'll have to do is bring it in here and convert it. So try to bring it in in depth the units you're working in, velocity in meters per second. It's a little wonky. Um, this is also why I'm not a particular fan of applying the sound velocity in high sweep in the survey. I like to apply it later. Again, personal preference, if you've got a small survey, this doesn't hurt. But if you've got a large survey, you might want to not apply these while you're surveying. Do it after the fact. That way you can sit down, review everything, and go from there. OK. So we have what makes a depth. This is just explaining. There's a lot of different meanings for the word depth, especially in hydrography. What do you mean when you say depth? First, we have the raw depth. This is the raw depth underneath the sonar, right? from the bottom to the water line. So we're going from bottom, so the raw depth, is the measured depth from the sonar, plus our draft, and any sound velocity corrections we have. Raw depth. Raw depth, the, time, the depth of the water at the time of survey. Then we have chart depth. So when you look at any nautical chart, if you haven't taken the time, you're going to see a datum depth or a datum, not a datum depth, but a datum, that all of those depths are referenced to. Most nautical charts in the US are referenced to mean low or low water. That datum is established by NOAA. There's a corrector to get from raw depth over into chart depth, depending where you're surveying. Could be that. Part of that component to get to the chart depth is a tide correction. So one thing I'm going to say that's a little bit annoying about high pack is the term tide. Totally screwed me up when I was an early hydrographer because I was used to surveying in the ocean, and I went up into the mountains to survey, and I didn't think about tide because I'm in the mountains. There's no tide up here. Didn't even occur to me. Tide means water level. So if you're in a reservoir, what's the pool elevation? What's the river uh, data? All of those come into play. And we have the separation value as a component of that as well. So for instance, if you're going to survey, let me check something here. There we go. If you're going to survey on mean low or low water, most of our monuments are not based on mean low or low water. They're based on NAVD 88 in the US. Okay, NAVD 88. Every tide station you go to has a different separation value between NAVD 88 and mean low or low water. 
If you attended John's session about RTKs and water levels, then you would know that. Well, then he explained it in more depth. Let me, that's what I was trying to say. So you have to know what that separation value is. Again, another potential for screwing it up. If you looked up the wrong corrector and you're using a static corrector, you could input that in wrong and now your tides are wrong. So again, when you're out there in the field, if you have some kind of water level gauge to reference to, go reference to it. There's a little bit of a caveats towards that and we'll talk about that when we get into offsets. So our measured depth, right? It's just rate and time. There we go. Oh, it's animated, I missed that. Ooh, up and down, right? So question that I like to ask a lot of people is what does a sonar measure? Many people say depth. A sonar does not measure depth. A sonar measures time. That's all it does. The time from when the sound was generated to the sound when the, or the time when the sound was received. So in order to get a depth, we need to know the sound velocity. So we'll get into sound velocity issues in a little bit here, but in order to get a depth, you need to know the sound velocity of water. So whether that's using an old school bar check method or using a sound velocity probe, which I highly recommend if you don't already have. A little example here. Oops, there we go. Nope, up, ah! Ha, there we go. Okay, so just an example here of exactly how we calculate it. So we have the sound velocity times the time divided by two, right? Two-way travel time, up and down. For the most part, your sonar is going to measure correctly. A lot of people think the sonar isn't measuring properly, but usually it is. Pretty rare that it's not giving you the right time. It might not give you the right depth because of sound velocity. Okay, I'm going to do that so we have it all because I know we're going to be a little short on time here. So in order to get our final depth, right, we've got to consider the sound velocity. What's the sound velocity of the water? Is there any other factors that are changing the sound velocity over the course of our survey? What is the datum that we're measuring? What are the offsets that we have in our vessel? What's the relationship between our echo sounder and our GPS or a navigation system. These are all things that are gonna factor into the overall potential for error in your final data set. Including what the surveyor had for breakfast because if you're surveying on an empty stomach, it usually doesn't go well. Okay, it's time velocity, or time velocity, sound velocity. Okay, single beam survey here. We have two different sound velocities. Now, if you're getting into single beam survey, all of the single beam systems require that you input in a sound speed within the echo sounder. Some of them have just a default, 1500 meters per second, and you can't change it. It's important that you know what that is. If I go out with an Odom E20 or a Teledyne E20, and I have in my sound velocity field 1450 meters per second, but then I go I don't know, say to the Dead Sea, it's nothing but salt. Sound speed is gonna be like 5,700 meters per second, some crazy value. But if I didn't change it in my echo sounder, now I'm getting an incorrect depth. Not a big deal as long as you know what that value is. Because if you know what that value is when you go into processing, you can back it out and apply a proper sound speed profile. So paying attention to what you enter into your devices is going to help you. This is where documentation comes in. What did you enter into the, sound, into the sounder for single beam? Multi beam, a little bit different here. Multi beam data. So if you were in my presentation earlier on um, single beam issues is one thing with a single beam, when you apply a sound speed profile to single beam, what we're doing is we're taking the time, we're back calculating the depth with the sound speed, figuring out the time, two-way travel time. Then we take the sound velocity profile and figure out how long that sound transmission was in each layer of water to give you a more accurate final depth. With multi-beam, we're doing that plus more. One of the things with multi-beam is we've got to figure out diffraction, refraction. Is it refraction or defraction? Refraction, okay, thank you. 
We have to calculate refraction, right? We're sending sound at an angle through the water. We have to figure out, is it gonna curve up or is it gonna curve down? We have to be pretty accurate about that. If you're not, what you wind up with is an artifact in your data. Data should be flat on a flat bottom. If you see a smile or frown, you've got a sound velocity issue. This is what sound velocity issues look like in your multi-beam data. Okay. So, I skipped ahead over to this slide with sound velocity and multi-beam. Okay, we have two sound velocity sources in a multi-beam system, okay? We have the probe that we lower down to the bottom. That's gonna get our profile, sound velocity through the water column. The secondary thing that we have for a multi-beam is we have sound velocity at the sonar head. It is absolutely imperative that the sound velocity at the sonar head be correct because that is used for beam forming. If you have a bad sound velocity at the head, the data is junk. So how do we avoid that? Okay, first, make sure everything's calibrated. Every manufacturer has a calibration, what do you call it, cycle that they recommend. Once a year is kind of the general recommendation. That being said, I've used AML sensors for a long time. After about two years, they'll start to drift. Take them, send them back to Canada, have them recalibrated. Way that you can check if something's going wrong, take your two sound velocity probes, compare them with each other. Do this regularly. Before the start of a survey, take your sound speed probe, lower it next to the sonar, and make sure they're reading the same value. They should be relatively the same value within about a meter per second. And that is whether you have a time of flight sensor or whether you have a CTD, like a castaway, calculating a sound speed. So we always wanna make sure that those are reading the same thing and that they are active. Another thing with sound velocity that is very common, unfortunately, and none of the manufacturers, last I checked, had any really good notifications of it. Multi-beam sonars allow you to input in a manual surface sound speed. They have a button to lock the sound speed. Awesome feature. I don't want them to get rid of it because if I'm surveying in a river and I've got cavitation or bubbles or rapids that I've got to survey through, I might have to lock the sound speed to one value because the sound speed sensor is getting bubbles in it. It's knocking out my sound speed. So I may have to lock it. The problem is, is a bunch of the manufacturers don't really do a good job of letting you know that you're in a manual sound speed situation or you've locked the sound speed. So you survey, you did that, you forgot to uncheck manual sound speed, then you go somewhere else, and now you do an entire day of survey with completely the wrong value, and you didn't even notice. And that's pretty much unrecoverable. Yeah. So that's a totally different thing. The, it's, well, fixing it, what I mean by fixing it is in the sonar user interface. So you'll fix it in there. Um, once you get it into the processor, there's, you can't fix anything if the sound speed was wrong. Not in processing. It's only in the sonar user interface. Now, there is some fudge factor stuff you can do to kind of recover the data, but you're gonna be faking it. Maybe that's acceptable, maybe that's not. That is for you to decide. But there is a sound velocity correction tool in MB Max 64. It is a royal pain in the ass to use. And it won't fake No. It will fake them. Don't recommend it. So, make sure your probes are calibrated You've checked them against each other. The other thing is how many casts do you take? I don't have a great answer for you on that one. The reason is, is because it depends on where you are. If I'm in the Columbia River, close to where I live, I know 
the certain section of river I live on, the sound velocity at the top is the same as the sound velocity as the bottom. So as long as my sound velocity sensor at the sonar head is reading correctly, I don't recommend it, but technically you can get away without a sound speed cast because the profile is vertical. Unless you're, at the mouth, like the Unless you're at the mouth or the confluence of two rivers. So I've got the Willamette and the Columbia coming together. They are at two different temperatures. Not, might not be very different temperatures, but they're still going to be two temperatures. They're going to come together, water's going to mix, and it's going to be a nightmare. You might have to take your swath width, narrow it up, because you know you're in a crazy sound velocity area. So you might have to narrow it up to avoid those outer beams. Sound velocity is going to get more extreme the further out you go from Nader. Okay. There are areas where you may not be able to take enough sound speed cast. Off the Oregon coast at certain times of year, you could take a cast every five minutes, you're still gonna have sound speed issues. You could be at the mouth of the Mississippi. Good luck, it's a sound velocity nightmare over there. So being very aware of where you are in the world and what you're surveying is gonna help you inform your sound speed. My first rule of thumb for sound speed is once an hour at least, adapt it from there. But again, pay attention to where you are. Okay, offsets. Everyone loves offsets. We all love offsets. So, fairly straightforward on offsets, what can screw you up? You measured wrong, you flipped the numbers, you measured in the wrong units. All of these will impact your data. So when you are measuring your offsets, be very careful. Also, when you're measuring your offsets, depending on the vessel that you're on, let me see what the next one is, there we go. Make sure you understand the sign convention of whatever device or software you're entering offsets into. Because each one might have something different. HiPack is a negative down software. Luckily, Atlantix is the same. No, negative up. Sorry, said that wrong. Strike that. Reverse it, in the words of Willy Wonka. Um, so, in other words, RTFM. Read the manual. Double check the sign conventions of your software and your hardware. Also, double check what units it's in. So, one thing that's very annoying about being in the US is that we love our feet. I don't know why, one day we're gonna get rid of them. But, high pack project might be in feet. You measure your vessel offsets, everything is in feet, then you go to enter it into the Aplanix. Aplanix doesn't like feet. It wants meters. <sighs> yeah, I mean luckily at least in your offsets, like that's such a small difference, you'll be okay, but it's royal pain in the ass. I don't like it. But. Keep aware of your units and where you're putting them. Along with what is X in this software, what is X in this software or hardware. The other thing that can happen, and this is very easy to do, is doubling up on your offsets. So for instance, in here, ref to sensor lever arm in an Aplanix. This is telling the Aplanix to output the data at that location. So that's from, say, the IMU to the sonar the diff distance. Then I go over here into high pack and I type the same numbers in. Now I am double applying the offsets. So keeping track of where your offsets go. It gets really complicated the more complicated your systems go. Especially if you've got the IMU mounted in the center of the boat, sonar's on one side of the boat, you've got a single beam up near the bow, it gets really complicated. So be aware of where you're putting the offsets and what the offsets are doing. So in the Aplanix, you'll see, can you see my mouth? Oh, you can, cool. So you'll see the ref to IMU target in the Aplanix. What is that doing? That is telling the Aplanix, don't output positions at the IMU. That's telling the Aplanix, output positions at whatever that location is. So for instance, if you're using a Norbit, Norbit takes this ref to IMU and they make it from the sonar reference point to the IMU. What that means is the Aplanix is outputting data as if it was mounted at the sonar reference point. 
So now that's going to change how we handle high pack offsets. Thanks for that, Kelly. I totally missed that. <laughs> awesome. So just an example of knowing where you put your offsets. Put them in the right spot. Same thing here. This happens pretty consistently. This is more of a single beam theme where you put the draft in the single beam, and then you also put it into high pack. You've double applied your draft. This squeaky floor is going to drive me nuts. OK. All right. How do you avoid it? Triple check your numbers. A great way of doing it is if you're measuring offsets, have two people measure the offsets. One person measures the offsets, comes up with their values. Do not tell the second person, and that person measures the offsets. Use a total station instead of using a tape measure. One problem a lot of people have is they assume a boat is square. I've been guilty of that. I went to a, set up a boat in the Philippines, did this whole level loop around the boat, still couldn't get things to line up. Things are about 50 centimeters off. Standing on the roof of the boat, trying to figure it out. Boat builder comes up, asks me what I'm doing. I tell him. He just starts laughing. And he goes, ah, oh, you assume the roof was welded on straight. It wasn't. I made an assumption. So don't do that. Don't assume things. Have multiple people look at it. If you're confused of where something goes, confer with other people. Ask, call support, et cetera. Oh, the last one here I will also mention as well. If you fire up survey and your boat is not pointing in the wrong, right direction, that's a really big clue that you screwed something up. And it could be an offset, or it could be as simple as you plugged the antenna into the wrong port. So we don't talk about it in this, but it's also setting up your equipment. Plug things in where they go. I'm totally guilty of plugging in antennas in backwards. OK. Positioning errors. So again, a lot of this we can check and verify before we start surveying, which is what you should do. So the first one is timing errors. Timing errors are a mismatch between navigation, motion, and the sonar. If those three things are not, well, typically your IMU and GPS are, if it's like a Planix or SBG or something, they're all the same. But that might not be going to your sonar properly. Part of the multi-beam that we feed over to the multi-beam, part of the data we send to it, is a ZEA message, a NEMA ZEA message, and a PPS pulse, or a pulse per second. So one pulse per second, usually a five hertz on, or five hertz, five volt on, five volt off signal. And we send that to the sonar in order to have proper timing. We have to match the sonar ping to the motion that's happening at that time. So we want to make sure that everything is time tagged. So when you're looking at your sonar user interface, most of them have a little PPS light or some timing indicator. Or if it's the top side box, there's a little blinky light that blinks a certain way when the timing is correct. Check it. Make sure it's working. If you go and survey a whole survey with not proper timing in your sonar, consider that survey a wash. It's lost. You might be able to fix it. Probably not. We also have geodetic parameters. Did you set those up properly? Did you use the right geoid or whatnot? And vessel motion in beam width, and I'll kind of leave those for the moment. So timing, this is kind of back to latency days. So way back when, we do a latency test. You'd run one line slow over an object or feature, and you turned around, run the same direction at twice the speed. So what we're looking for there is a positional error because, or what this is, is it's a time delay between the calculate, calculation of the position and the output of the position. The good part is, is most of the systems nowadays, pretty much all of them, don't really have latency. It is still something that I recommend you test, at least on initial setup of the system. Let's try to run a latency test. Make sure your timing works.
This is more for single beam. Uh, Multi-beam, you absolutely must have a motion system or a motion sensor of some sort, whether that's an INS system or a decoupled MRU heading system, must be accounted for. So I'm going to skip over this slide. This is kind of more towards single beam about whether or not you can do it or not. So beam width here, again, not so much something you have to worry about with most multi-beams. Uh, this is kind of a single beam thing. You will see it a little bit in some of the more affordable systems, like your two degree MB1, MB2, Norbit standard two degree system. You might see a little bit of slope migration, not very much, but it does exist. So just be aware of what your sonar is. More likely cause in many respects with a position error is probably because maybe you set up your geodesy wrong. So whether that is something where you set up the wrong state plane system, or in this case here, this is data collected with RTX. If you use RTX in North America, you have to do a time varied transformation, time variable, time varied transformation. Because RTX is based on ITRF and we're using NAT83. So that's a time based datum. We've got to correct for that. So we have a tool in HiPAC to do a time varied transformation. These two lines, it's the same set of data. One has a time varied transformation, one does not. So again, make sure you set that up properly. The good news is if you screw this up, this we can fix after the fact. But best to not have to fix it if we don't need to. Yeah. Uh, so the new datum gets rid of it, but that doesn't mean it's still not being used. It depends on your specs. It's a, I hope it does. That'll make life easier, but, oh, they're still using USV. Absolutely. That's not going away for a couple more years. Even if it says it's going away, it's not going away, unfortunately, due to legacy projects or historical projects. So. It is the new data datum that's coming out is supposed to get rid of it officially for all state plane coordinates, but that's not in practice. It's probably not going to work that way. Just knowing how everything works. So, all right, but that is an awesome. Oh, sorry. I missed this thing. This is us feet and international feet as well. And the time varied transformation It's like two things in one. Okay. So I won't go into too much depth about actual datums and how we compute all of this. Hopefully, if you want more information on this, you went to John's talk about RTK and tides. But suffice to say, when we're doing our tidal corrections, most of our data nowadays is going to be corrected with a geoid model. And we're going to go from some geoid model, which is at some datum, and we're either going to stay at that datum or we're going to move it to another datum, such as mean low or low water, mean sea level, whatever. So just kind of an example here of how this is computed. Hopefully you attended John's thing. Again, this is more just reiteration if you saw John's talk, but picking how you're going to do your RTK tides. And by RTK tides, it really should be RTK water levels. It's a nomenclature thing, but that's what it is. So picking which one you did, are you going to use a KTD file? If you made your own KTD file, did you pick the right numbers to go in your KTD file? If you're using a geoid in KTD, is that the correct pair that you did it on? Did you use the right separation value? So if I'm gonna go survey here in Savannah and I'm gonna use the tide gauge, whatever one's closest, I need to go onto that page and find out what my separation value is between geoid 2018 and AVD 88, I mean lower low water. And that's a separation value that is only good right next to that gauge. As you move further away from that gauge, it's not quite right anymore, which is why we have, in the US at least, V datum. So V datum takes that and models all the tide gauges together. So if you're surveying in a really small area close to a tide gauge, you might be able to get away with one single value. 
If you're surveying a larger area or further away from a single tide station, V data might be a better option for you. So again, John talked about this earlier, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it, but just be aware of what datum you're surveying on and did you set it up properly? Did you use the correct numbers? Our orthometric height correction, also known as the fudge factor. So it's in here, a lot of people will show up to a gauge, they find out they're three tenths of a foot off and they just add three tenths of a foot in here. They don't bother figuring out why you're three tenths of a foot off. So a couple things to know when you go pull up to a tide gauge, especially with RTK. RTK changes a lot of things and we're gonna get into a couple others here in a minute. But RTK at least, when you're running RTK, we don't actually care where the water level is. The way to think about that, kind of the simplified explanation of why we don't care, is think about the boat and the sonar as a survey rod, a two meter survey rod, right? Got my GPS antenna at the top, my point down at the bottom, I'm sticking it on a monument, right? Think of the water level as where your hand is on that pole. If my hand's here, that's still the same height. If my hand's here, that's still the same elevation value. So the value when you go to check in to say a tide gauge, all of your offsets may be 100% correct. Everything is perfectly laid out relative to each other. You've just picked the wrong spot for where your water level is. So knowing how you've set up your boat, again, comes back into play. And then we have what method of RTK you're going to be doing. So are you gonna be doing RTK? How are you getting your correctors? Are they coming over the internet? Are they coming through a base station? Are you using a single base station? Are you using a VRS solution? If you're using a single base station, are you more than 20 kilometers away from that base station? All of these things need to be factored in when you're planning out your survey. For PPK data, always I recommend in any multi-beam survey, if your system has the ability to log the raw INS or raw GPS observables, log it. Log every ounce of data you can. So for instance, I take in a Planix, I set it up and I screw up the offsets entirely. Went out, did a survey. I come back, find out none of my data is matching up. Somebody goes, well, what were the offsets in the Planix? You go, look, you find out they're wrong. If I didn't record the raw data, I can't fix it very easily. <laughs> but if I have the raw INS data, I can take it into pause MMS, change my offsets, output an SBET file, and I'm back in business. So log all the data you can, you might fix it later. Or PPK, if you lost RTK or lost cell, that's a, an option there. Satellite-based systems, these can be really handy if you're offshore, or like Galveston. In the middle of Galveston Bay, they use RTX. RTX is a paid subscription from a Planix. It'll get you about four centimeters-ish. And PPP, I won't go over that too much, but. This is, goes back to the time-varied transformation that I already mentioned, I kind of went ahead of myself there. If you're using RTX, um, or a couple other services, you might need to have this time varied transformation in there. Uh, a new feature in here, if I hit the button, did it come in? There we go. A new thing that came in here just this year is that we now actually do the height transformation. So make sure if you're using anything that needs a time varied transformation or time variable transformation that you click the enable height. Older versions of HiPack will not have that. They will have the time varied transformation but there's this old spreadsheet that we've been using for the past few years. So be aware of what your datum is, what you need to do to get on the correct datum. So again, two lines, one collected with, or one with time varied, one without. So what do you do if your geodesy is set incorrectly? Luckily, it's pretty straightforward. In HiPack, when you go in there to process your data, there's two ways you can correct it. One is something called, well, three ways technically. Two of them are pretty much the same thing. 
raw file adjustment and a GPS adjust. What those do is a raw file adjustment is going to go back to the raw files. It's high pack when you collect multi-beam, gives you a raw file and an HSX. It's going to go to the raw file. It's going to grab the ellipsoid height out of that file. It's going to run it through your geodetic parameters. So what you do if you have to correct it is you go into, before you open up MB Max, change your geodesy to what it should be, come back over here, open up the raw file adjustment. It's going to grab that ellipsoid value, run it back through geodesy that you just changed, and correct your data. So in here, we have the option to recalculate positions based on project geodesy, as well as recalculate tides based on project geodesy. This is also nice. This will also fix if you put like the wrong UTM zone or something. It'll output the data, it'll correct the data, put it on the right projection. There's some other stuff with that, and we'll talk about that in another session. But you can correct it this way. I'll keep this slide up. The other way that you can correct it is if you have a PPK file. So whether that's an SBET, an ASCII corrected file from like RTK lib, you go in there and you do a pause pack adjustment or a GPS adjust, it's going to grab the position data, run it through geodesy, and fix your data. Fairly straightforward. OK, so again, verify your offsets, confirm the projection datum, check your base station, make sure all the equipment is timed, properly synced up, understand the limits of your equipment. That's a big one, too. Didn't really have a specific slide for it. But did you exceed the limitations of your equipment? Can totally happen, whether that's weather, positional accuracy, et cetera. Always log all data that you can. Log the raw INS data. Even if you don't have the software to process it, log it. Because if you don't have it and you find you need it, you can always find somebody you can pay to process it. So keep that in mind. And if you're not using RTK, you're going to have to utilize a draft table. We'll get, I think there's a few slides later on, if I remember right. Yeah, okay, good. Heave. Heave is a pain in the ass. That was some sighing right there. Okay. Hopefully, if you are using RTK, that kind of helps out. Not kind of. It significantly helps out with heave. Okay. One of the problems with heave, unlike pitch and roll, heave is not a gravity-based measurement. Zero is defined by the system when you turn it on. The problem with that is as you go out through the day, if you have like tide coming in, the water is going up. Therefore, you technically are moving up the entire day. So what the systems have to do for heave is they move zero as you go throughout the day. What this relates to is heave artifacts in your data. So this is where if you're looking at your data and you see wavies, the humps up and down across the entire swath, that's a heave artifact. You'll also see wibble wobbles, but that's a different motion. So heave. I know. I, <laughs> oh, we all hate heave artifacts. So this is where what's really nice is if you have RTK, you can kind of negate some of this. Because RTK, if your output rate is high enough, so if your GPS is outputting at, say, 25 hertz, I think the minimum that's been tested is 10, but I would say 25 to 50 hertz of data. If it's recording that and you've got good RTK, that RTK measurement is going to be more accurate than the heave sensor in measuring the vertical motion of the boat. So I can take heave, I can tell high pack when I'm in processing, there's an option if you went to the processing session, there's an option for merge tide data with heave. What that's going to do is that's going to take RTK position one, RTK position two, and in between those two position fixes, it's going to utilize the heave sensor to fill in the gap. So that factors out a lot of our heave artifacts, but it also allows high pack, say if you go underneath a bridge and you lose RTK, 
it allows HiPack to fall back on the heave sensor. So we don't entirely want to get rid of it. There are applications still for the heave sensor despite its inaccuracies. So this goes to what I was just saying here, the double application of heave. This happens a lot, heave and tide. Because we have two systems measuring the vertical motion of our boat, again, we can double apply it. So we have to figure out how we're going to handle that. So if you're in Joe's session of processing, he went over this, but we've got to avoid the double heave. We have two ways to do that. One is to average the tide data out. So I've got all my squigglies going up and down, and I just run an average through that of whatever time frame I set here. So 30 seconds is kind of the default. That may work for your application. There may be other applications where you do 120 seconds or 300 seconds. The most common one that I start out with is the very bottom, merge tide data with heave. The word merge is an incredibly scary word, and I hate that we use it because merging sounds like I'm gonna double apply it, but it's not going to double apply, it's just going to allow HiPack to switch between the RTK vertical value and fill in the gaps with the heave sensor. So I start by going with merge tie data with heave, and then if not, I'll swap it, yeah. Correct. Yeah, so the order of operations in the high pack is the manual tide, then a tide file, if you put it in there, and then this. So if a tide file is loaded, this goes away and you don't have the option anymore. So you're not using the tide, I haven't used the tide file in like a year. I've been using the tide file. Perfect. Stay doing that. Yeah. Because like I said, a tide file, you're getting it from a gauge that's over here, but your survey might be over there. And we used to have to do this tidal zoning BS that was a pain in the butt and it had range correctors and time correctors. It was a royal pain in the ass. RTK kind of gets rid of that in conjunction with like a V datum or some other model. So if you can, use RTK. Uh, I had something else I was gonna say about this and I forgot what it was. I'll remember it in a minute and I'll come back. The other thing we have with a heave sensor is called induced heave. This comes from a improper calculation because you don't have the IMU mounted at the center of the boat's center of rotation. So the way that I kind of think about this, induced heave in terms of a multi-beam or any other sonar, induced heave is an improper calculation of the draft. What do I mean by that? If I have my IMU mounted off the side of the boat and say my boat is perfectly level, I'm gonna get a heave value. I'm gonna get a heave value because the system has defined where zero is, where that zero heave value is. Surveying along, everything's happy. Now I go and get, for whatever reason, I get a 55 gallon drum of whatever and set it on the back deck on the port side. Now my boat is listing over to port. This is the simple way that I think about it. It's listing over to port. I've changed the draft of the sonar because the boat's rolled over to the side. Well, what happens is, is after a certain period of time, the heave is going through a Kalman filter. What that means is that it's constantly figuring out, does it need to adjust zero? Where zero is, does it need to move it? If I have my IMU off to the side and I haven't, told the system that it's mounted off to the side, what happens is, is now the system moves zero. It moves that zero point and it moves it down. So now when you go to apply it, you have an improper calculation of how deep the sonar is in the water. If I tell the system that you're mounted off to the side or up in the bow or to the stern of the boat, then the system looks at the roll and back computes and doesn't allow the zero point to move. Therefore, when you look at the graph, and there's an article I wrote, you can go look at it, it's on the Sounding Better articles. When you look at the graph, it shows that there's a displacement, a change in the draft of the sonar. So induced heave, make sure you, know, you let the system know it's off to the side of the boat. You can do that either in the software or in high pack. This is another place 
where you can screw it up. So inside of an Aplanix, for instance, Aplanix has a ref to COR value or a ref to COR place. In there, you can say the IMU is mounted this far port starboard and aft. Port, yeah, port or starboard and aft. That's not going to change the navigation value. It's not going to change the output of where it's outputting the positions. It's just letting the system know it's off to the side. The problem is, is if I put those values in the Aplanix, for instance, then I go to HiPack and also put those values in and check a checkbox that says correct induced heave, which was right there, checked here. If I check that and I have a ref to COR offset in the Aplanix, I'm now double correcting my data. So again, know how your system is set up, how it's configured. Heave drift is something that is a little less common nowadays, but still does happen. What this is, the best way to think about it is if you're on the boat, you end a line and you turn the boat around, that turn is going to induce a heave detection or a heave moment in the IMU or the MRU. So what it causes at the beginning of the line, it looks like you have a bubble in your heave and it comes up. And then as you go through the line, it'll taper its way back down to where it should be. So ways to avoid this is one, there's a checkbox. That high pack is gonna recognize you made the turn. It's gonna try to flatten that out for you. The other way you avoid it is you add in a lot of lead time into your line. So you end a line, you keep going straight, turn around and give yourself you know, 45 seconds of time before you hit your survey line and hit control S. Let the heave come back down. If you have like an Aplanix or SPG, this still happens, but not nearly to the extent that we have here. And it's almost undetectable in many cases. Heave drift, that's kind of what I was talking about here. All right, dynamic draft. Hopefully you're all using RTK and you never have to worry about this again. So what is dynamic draft? So dynamic draft is when you're in any vessel, as soon as you hit the throttle, that vessel is gonna start squatting down in the water. It's gonna get lower in the water. So that's gonna decrease the distance from our transducer to the bottom. That distance as we throttle the boat up and down is gonna change depending on our throttle settings and depending on the current that you're running in. So one thing that's very annoying, let me see what the slide is afterwards. Oh, let me animate this. There we go. Whee. Okay. So one thing here with dynamic draft, the way that high pack applies dynamic draft is that we apply it by a speed table. So you take, you take your vessel out and you figure out the change, your dynamic draft. There's different ways you can do it. We can talk about it later. Hopefully you never have to. But you have to create this table. You apply this table in processing. So it says, okay, the vessel speed was say, you know, three knots here. I'm gonna change my depths by a 10th of a foot here in the negative direction. Fine and dandy. Really big problem with this with inland surveying. If you're inland surveying, we're surveying on rivers, which means if we're going upstream at a throttle of 1500 RPM, we're gonna be going a lot slower than if we're going downstream with a throttle setting of 1500 RPM. We don't have a good way to apply dynamic draft in that case. So what a lot of people do is instead of using a table, you manually change the draft each individual line in processing and you keep track of like your engine RPMs and you go by engine RPMs instead of vessel speed. This is a royal pain in the ass. If you can avoid it, do it. But be aware that if you don't have RTK, you're going to have to do this or else your data is going to be incorrect by whatever amount. And some of these numbers look pretty small, but I've seen in some of the larger boats, They'll squat down two feet in some cases. One, yeah. 
Which is why I'm glad you're using RTK now, because holy crap, that was a pain in the ass. <sighs> I talk faster here. Okay, RTK Tides gets rid of your need for a dynamic draft table. Long story short, use RTK. I'm gonna go through this really quick. Anybody ask any questions? So RTK gets rid of dynamic draft issues. Doesn't get rid of them, it's just a better way of correcting for them. Let me put it that way. Okay. Misplaced draft offset. Again, it can happen in here. Prevent he's in dynamic draft issues. Provide the COR for your INS system. Use delayed heave. So we really didn't talk about it, but a lot of the INS systems nowadays will do a delayed heave, which means that it's recalculating your heave, usually five or so minutes behind where you are in real time. Recalculates it, does a better job at it. You can apply that in MB max or SB max to your data. Use RTK or PPK. And then if you're going to use dynamic draft, go ahead and do that. Okay. Fish and weeds. It doesn't like that. That's errors as well. I'm just gonna go through here and make sure there's nothing else I wanted to talk about. Okay, good. Whew. Almost right on time. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns, bad jokes. Some, one day somebody's gonna come up with a joke. It's gonna happen. Everybody's good? Sweet, thank you for coming. <laughs>